Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 1978 horror film, Martin. Now, this is a film that I'd heard a lot of good things about, but I didn't really get around to seeing it until now. And after watching it, I am really glad that I did because I absolutely loved this film. I thought Martin was a marvelous movie, a diamond in the rough, and an absolute gem and I personally feel that this is one of George Romero's finest efforts and one of the best films that I've seen him direct. And I'm not alone on that either because there were there was a list by Time Out of what a bunch of writers, scholars, and critics considered to be the best films of the horror genre, and Martin was on the list. Martin is also a film that Romero himself has actually name-dropped as the fav his favorite film that he's done. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, this is a movie that actually does live up to the hype. I was kind of worried about it at first because I heard all these great things, all these wonderful things from all these different critics, and I thought it might be one of those movies that didn't quite live up to the hype and to what the critics were saying. But that's not the case. I only had a very minor issue with the film that knocked it down a little bit that prevented it from being a five-star flick for me but nothing that really affected the overall structure or the overall film or the overall quality of it that much it was just a very minor thing I, I felt the film could have been paced a little bit better because it's kind of dialogue heavy and there's a lot of scenes where there isn't really a lot that's happening. It's a lot of character building moments. There's a lot of drama in it. Uh, so that kind of makes it a bit of a slower paced film. Uh, I, I tend to like a little bit faster paced movies. I don't mind slow. I don't mind slow burns, but uh, I just felt that there were some scenes that where the film kind of dragged a little bit. But other than that, Everything else about this film and the production was top-notch. George A. Romero directed the film, and uh, this is a film that he decided to do uh, in a lot of ways because he wanted to make up for... Make up is not the word. Uh, he wanted to pay off his debts. Uh, his previous films he had directed, uh, Vanilla, Season of the Witch... The Crazies, they were all films that didn't do that well in the box office, so they didn't really help him financially. So he was in debt by the time he directed Martin. He was actually a million dollars in debt, which back then is a lot of money. So, but sadly, even after he did Martin, Martin only got a very limited theatrical release, so it didn't really do that well in the box office. So that Martin didn't really do anything to help him pay off his debts. Uh, so it wasn't until Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead where, Ro where Romero was actually able to pay off his million dollar debt. And it's one of those films though he also decided to do because I believe there was some, uh, that he had some inspiration for it and he was also good friends with the producer Richard P. Rubenstein who had worked with Romero I don't know if he worked with him before this, but I know he would work with Romero for a lot of other projects and films down the road. Uh, Romero also wrote the film, and uh, the film features a really talented cast. You have John Amplis, who plays Martin, and John Amplis delivers a absolutely stunning, important, you know, stunning, important performance. Uh, it's so stunning, I can't even uh, speak. Completely blew me away. So much so that I'm having a hard time thinking of the right words to say to describe how great his performance was. You would ha absolutely be hard-pressed to believe that this is a performance by an actor who had never acted on film before. But that's the case. He was a stage actor, he had done a lot of uh, work on stage, but he had not really done anything on film yet, and Romero saw him on stage and was impressed by his work, and he wanted to give him the shot, 
uh, to play this role, and he took the ball and ran with it. And Amplis, in my opinion, his performance in this as Martin is one of the most underrated acting performances of all time. This is a performance that I personally felt was Oscar worthy. It was that impressive. It was that good. And it needed to be because Martin is the main character. This is a character piece. This is a film that is a character study of this tragic young man who, depending on what you believe, could be a vampire or could just be a a man, a young man who's been delusioned, who's been deluded by and disillusioned by his upbringing and by his family into believing that he's a vampire into believing that he needs to drink blood to survive and that's a great aspect of Romero's script it's it's vague but it's not to the point where it's upsetting it just leaves things up to interpretation Uh, You can interpret the film as a character study of a modern day vampire or at least modern day in the term in terms of when the film was released. Or you can look at it as a character study of a disturbed young man who due to years of being deluded and tricked and manipulated by Tatakuda, who is... I believe was it was like an uncle or, or or at least somebody who was um related to him because Martin is his nephew. Years and years of this have led to him believing in all of these stories and all of these tall tales that his family has been telling him about this family curse and how he's a vampire and how he's 84 years old and he needs to drink blood to survive. So you can look at it that way. And and that's honestly how I look at it. And that's how Romero looks at it too. Because he was interviewed on a short documentary on this DVD. It's more of a featurette than a documentary. And he said the same thing. He believes that's the interpretation that he he, he decides to go with. That he, he believed in as well. Was that Martin wasn't really a vampire. He was a normal young man, a human, who was just completely delusioned, disillusioned to the point where he he had become psychotic. Which in a lot of ways is actually even more terrifying than just a straight-up vampire story. And that's one of the many things that makes this film stand out from a lot of other films that not only Romero has directed, but a lot of other movies like it. And as a strong supporting cast, you got Lincoln Mazel, who plays Tatakuda, who I like to call uh, Colonel Sanders Vampire Hunter, because he looks like Colonel Sanders, and, and he's kind of got this Van Helsing vibe. Christine Forrest plays uh, Cousin Christina, who's uh, Martin's cousin, who wants to help Martin and doesn't believe that he's a vampire, and is trying to get him to know this, and trying to get him help. And it's a character that is very well written and adds to the sympathy that you do feel for Martin, despite these horrific things that he does, where he uses a razor blade, he drugs these women or drugs these people, cuts their wrists with razor blades and drinks their blood. This is, a, and in some instances, also rapes them, which is really hard for me to really truly be 100% sympathetic with the character because of that. But you can't help but feel a little bit sorry for Martin because this is something that was just forced upon him at a young age. And all because of his environment, because of how he was raised, how he, how he grew up, people around him who were telling him all these things, he eventually just felt like that's who he is. He is a vampire. He does need blood to survive. But he isn't. He doesn't do a lot of the other things that other vampires do because he believes that he's not like all the other, you know, he believes vampires are not like what they are in the movies. There is no magic. There's no real magic ever. And so he believes that real vampires are like himself. And he even takes on the guise of the Count 
uh, when he's sharing his mindset and his thoughts and things that he's done over the radio and some actually really clever sequences that really help the story progress a little bit and give you a little bit more insight on Martin in a clever way. You also have Elaine Nadeau, who plays Abby Santini, who is this older woman that befriends Martin, who Martin's been helping her out, helping her out, helping her out around the house, delivering some meat to her. They eventually form a little bit of a relationship, and she's a very sweet woman who, when you find out what happens to her at the end, it is absolutely devastating. And I don't really want to give it away because there's there's a really effective ending in Martin. And I, I don't really want to give away the progression and how everything happens for those of you who haven't seen it. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Tom Savini also has a bit role as Arthur, Christina's boyfriend. This was actually also another first. Uh, this was uh, the first collaboration between Savini and George Romero, and the first of many to come. Uh, it was also the first film that he did where he did splatter effects. Before this, he did some other type of practical makeup effects, but he didn't really do splatter or gore. Martin was Savini's first foray into splatter, and... As you all know, Savini would become one of the makeup effects artists who would absolutely be on the Mount Rushmore of makeup effects artists. Uh, and in large part, it's because of his dabbling, his first foray into splatter effects in Martin. So th that's that is absolutely a great thing and uh apparently Romero had wanted Savini before for uh, another film but he wasn't able to get him because something just didn't work out and thankfully fate would intervene and Romero and Savini would actually eventually in this film have a collaboration and they would go on to be really good friends and they would go on to collaborate more in the future in, of course, films like Dawn of the Dead, which came out around the same time as Martin. And this is a film where Savini did a lot of the stunts as well. So Savini did some stunt work for Martin, and he gained the trust of Romero, and so then he was able to do more stunts for Dawn and so on, and work on the effects for a lot of Romero's other films. Romero himself also has a cameo role as a priest, uh, and you also have future Monkey Shines editor Pasquale Buba, who plays a drug dealer who gets shot by the police in one scene. It's a very small film in terms of its production, in terms of its cast. It's the type of movie you, will, you don't see nowadays, and you more likely will never see again. Uh, this was a film where you had a, a, a small cast, not not any real big names. John Amplis, in my opinion, should have been a big name after this, but sadly it's a film that came and went in theaters and didn't really do very well, and nobody really saw it. So it's kind of it was really hard for Amplis to really sink his teeth into things or, or really leave a mark. And... Romero did a lot of different duties on the film's production. Uh, he was not only the writer, but he also edited the film. And he started out as a cinematographer, and he eventually was not really that... Well, I don't think he, he was fine with his job, but he saw some potential in Michael Gornick, and he just asked Michael, he said, Hey, Michael, do you want to direct... Do you want to shoot the film? Do you want to do cinematography? Do you want to be the DP? And Michael said yes. Yes, and that started a wonderful collaboration between the two. So this film was also a first for Michael Gornick. It was the first film that he did the cinematography for. And 
it, this is this is just an amazing movie in a lot of ways because there are so many firsts in this first film that Gornick did cinematography for and you would never know because he looked like an absolute natural he brought to life the seedy atmosphere and mood of the location which is shot in Braddock Pennsylvania which was this rundown dilapidated part of Pennsylvania where the steel mills had all left and so now all that was left was this devastation the aftermath of the main hub the heart of this town being ripped out and the the location looks even worse nowadays but it still was just a perfect location for this and gornick really did bring the location and the setting to life in a way where it became its own character and when that happens that's some great cinematography Romero and Gornick also work really well together, so that also adds to it. And Romero's direction in this is also delectable and absolutely fantastic. I really can't think of a better director for this film. I can't think of anybody else who could have got the most out of Martin, like Romero did, especially with the budget. It was $80,000. This movie cost $80,000 to make. There are a lot of filmmakers, a lot of movies, a lot of low-budget independent productions nowadays that really would not end up turning out or giving you as high quality of, of a film as Martin is. And this is $80,000. This looks like a theatrical film. This does not look or feel like a low-budget production, and in large part that's because of Romero and his talents as a director. He sets up his shots wonderfully. He does a great job really creating atmosphere and mood, this eerie feel and look to the film. It has this very surreal vibe and in large parts because of Romero's direction and because of the absolutely great job that he does directing the film. He also does a good job, equally as great job, writing the movie he really writes some deeply human characters. Even Martin doesn't feel like he's totally a monster. And he could have easily had the character be like that. I think originally they were going to have an older man play Martin, but decided to go against that and went with a younger man, which made the film so much better. And also made it stand out in a good way. Because this is... It made it so much more tragic and so much more memorable because you don't see very many films like this where you have a younger male, I mean, not necessarily male, there's nothing to do with gender, but you don't really see a film like this where you have this younger character, this young man who is your psychotic lead, your character who is doing all of these crimes and murders and deaths and so on. This, in a lot of ways, because it's a char character study and follows Martin around, which was the absolute right choice because Martin is a very fascinating, interesting character. He's a sad and tragic character, but he's still very interesting and intriguing and the most interesting character in the film. So it makes sense that you would center the film around the character of Martin. This, in a lot of ways, is a precursor to other films that had similar structure, like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer or Maniac. So, it's in a lot of ways, this film kind of broke new ground that would eventually be followed up upon by other those other films that I mentioned and other films after that, and even other movies that... I might not have mentioned because there are a lot of other films that took the same kind of idea and approach that Martin did. And the film also features another first in the score by Donald Rubenstein, which is absolutely beautiful. It is a beautiful score. I especially love the opening credits, the main theme, the calling, that is, that is one of the most beautifully tragic pieces of music I've ever heard. And it absolutely 
solidifies this film's status as a true classic because this is a score that really elevates the film to a whole nother level, to a whole nother plane, because of how truly fantastic and spectacular this score is. This is a score that by itself just oozes atmosphere and mood and really just makes you feel all kinds of different emotions. A lot of tragic sadness, a lot of remorse, grief, and uh, it it's also makes certain scenes even more eerie because it's got this strange, surreal sound to it. I, I cannot believe that this was the first score that Donald Rubenstein ever did. And it, it, there's just, it really does blow me away when I think about it, how many firsts there are from the people who worked on the film and how it's not even, belie you can't even believe it. It's unbelievable that this is not the work of somebody who's been doing a score for years and years. This is not the work of an actor who has not been in multiple films. You know, you cannot believe that this is the work of an actor who is just John Amplis is just that good. And Gornick's cinematography is that good that you can't believe, oh, this guy must have been nominated for an Oscar at some point. No, it's just, it is, it, it, it kind of leaves you speechless when you think about all these different elements and how well they worked together in the film and how, just unreal it is like it, it, it just i i it's 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 just absolutely jaw dropping and there are no words sometimes to to really truly explain or express how impressive the work by the by everyone involved in this film is now i don't really know what else to say about martin um, except, I mean, th th it's not really your traditional horror film. It's not a traditional vampire movie either. It's more of, like I said, it's more of a character study. It's more of a character study. It's more of a drama than it is a traditional horror film. But it's a very effective drama and a very effective character study. From the very beginning, it grabs you by the throat and doesn't let go. Uh, it, it just is a very shocking, intense opening sequence, and you're automatically grabbed by it, and then the film continues to have your attention and continues to enthrall you as it goes forward, all the way until its memorable, intense, and shocking ending, which has more than one just element that just comes out there and socks you right in the face and in a good way though because it's the type of ending that just leaves you stunned and it it resonates with you emotionally now this is a film that has a good amount of reviews by a lot of critics uh there was a guy from the austin chronicle he says it grabs you by the short hairs grabs the audience by the short short hairs Absolutely agree with that. It grabs you by the short hairs and then some. Uh, Gary Arnold from the Washington Post called Martin an eerie sardonic updating of the traditional vampire legend. I agree with that wholeheartedly as well. And this is a film that I highly recommend. I absolutely really do give this film my highest recommendation. Uh, this is a movie that if you haven't seen it already, you should definitely check it out. And I don't really know what else to say about Martin, except if I were if I were to rate it out of five stars, I would give the film four and a half out of five stars. It's that good of a film to me. The only problem I have with it is the pacing. I think some things could have been tightened up a little bit, could have had a little bit more scenes with Martin, a little bit more going on, um, but nothing really too detrimental. Uh, overall, it's it's an absolutely masterful film, and... I really do wish this was on Blu-ray, and I wish this DVD wasn't so hard to find, because that's too bad, because more people should be discovering this film, and it's hard for people to do that because the DVD is so hard to find, and it's out of print. This is the Lionsgate DVD. There's an Arrow Video DVD, Arrow, and uh, I think it's, over, it's, it's an overseas release, so it's not region-free. 
And I, I think that might also be out of print as well. And apparently I read somewhere Arrow was going to release it on Blu-ray, but then something happened and it did not end up being released. So to this day, we have piece of shit films like Star Crystal on Blu-ray. We don't have Martin. And that's a shame. That's a crying shame. And I just got to say, watch it. Find it. Wherever you can find it. If I, I believe it's on YouTube. In fact, it is. And I'm going to put a link to the film in the video description down below. Because this is a film that I feel that everybody should see. At least once. I think it's that good and that great of a film. So, and especially if you're a fan of the horror genre, and absolutely if you are a fan of Romero, of George A. Romero. This is one of his finest works, and it really does show. And it's it's a film that has aged beautifully. It's aged like a fine wine. Even the elements in it that could be considered of its time make the film stand out and make it actually even more unique and make it a film that when you watch it now it acts as a time capsule it acts as a time capsule of a particular time period and a particular setting in a particular place just like a film like chud does it just it, it captures that wonderfully and just makes the film even better it makes the experience even sweeter so, yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to say about Martin. Uh, I, I, I really cannot say or sing enough praises about this film. And uh, fingers crossed it gets a Blu-ray release because it deserves it. It deserves a 2K remaster. It deserves a DVD. It deserves, no, not DVD. It already has a DVD, but it deserves a Blu-ray just absolutely loaded with features. Because this DVD is fine, it's got a it's got a solid commentary track, and it's got a short little featurette, and TV spots and trailers, and it's got a good transfer of the film, but I still feel that this this deserves a lo a lot better. But overall, I've rambled enough, uh, and I hope you guys enjoyed the review. And as always, I will see you later. See ya.